Welcome to our Ash Wednesday service. Uh, for obvious reasons, we won't be doing the imposition of ashes this evening, although there will be a point in the service uh, where you will see the ashes that are here on my left, um, and it will be just before Sarah begins to do, play some meditative music, and that's the point when we would usually do the imposition of ashes. And so this evening, what I'd welcome you to do is make another ancient sign and that is to inscribe your forehead with your thumb at that point and make that a gesture of your penitence this evening. We begin with hymn number 614, Forgive Our Sins as We Forgive, uh, the words of which are found in your order of service. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you despise nothing you have made, and forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our brokenness, may obtain of you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Joel. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. 
Their like has never been from of old, nor will be again after them in ages to come. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he's gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord, your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? The word of the Lord. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the church in Corinth. We entreat you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, 
At an acceptable time, I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation, I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God. With the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as pure, poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The word of the Lord. Praise Thanks be to God. God.
early in the fifth century, a monk by the name of John Cassian sat at his desk and he started to write. He had learned a lot about the spiritual life, and so his bishop asked him to write down what he had learned. So he did. He tells a story about traveling with his friend Germanus, the two of them seeking the wisdom of the abbas who had fled the cities and the towns in search of God in the deserts of northern Egypt. The two monks first find Abba Moses, and they sit at his feet. Except that Abba Moses wouldn't talk. We were tearfully begging for an edifying word from that Abba, says John, but eventually, since we were eager to be thoroughly instructed by him, he finally began to speak, worn out by our pleading. And so what Abba Moses talks to John and his friend Germanus about, in part, is why one would go about doing such strange things as fasting, or acts of mercy towards the poor, or reading and meditating on scripture, or staying up late and persevering in prayer. And it's this that I'll speak about briefly tonight drawing from those conversations with Abba Moses and as we ourselves embark upon the season of Lent, why exactly is it that we take part in such practices? Well, the answer is rather simple, as it turns out. We do it for and out of love. One of the first things that Abba Moses wanted to know was why those two young monks, what it was those two young monks were seeking. The kingdom of heaven, say Germanus and John. But the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is an end, says Abba Moses. That's where we are heading, but how does one get there? To answer that, Abba Moses talks about farmers. What a farmer seeks is a secure and comfortable life. But to get that secure and comfortable life, a farmer will clear the fields, will pull up weeds, will toil away in planting and harvesting. And for Abba Moses, the spiritual life is a lot like that. For us, as we seek the kingdom of heaven, we work and toil away in a different way. Instead of pulling weeds and tilling fields, the work set out for us is fasting, is spending times in prayer, is meditating on scripture, and performing acts of mercy. And this is what gives us purity of heart, says Abba Moses. These are the things that make our hearts ready to love. And if we are ready and able to love and to love God above all things, we are preparing ourselves for our end, for what we seek and where we are headed, the kingdom of heaven. And as all these efforts pass away with this world, that love will remain. So it makes for kind of a good test, I think, Let's say you've decided to fast from coffee, but the lack of caffeine makes you entirely ill-tempered and your family doesn't want to spend any time with you. Or perhaps you're trying to tame a bodily appetite. Tackling a vice in order that you would grow in love of God rather than in service of your stomach. But are you growing in love of God if you're little more than grumpy towards your friends? Or let's say you've decided that you will freely give alms to the poor because money has become an idol for you, a means of control, perhaps, over others. But giving away your money only makes you complain more about how others will spend it. Or that you never got around during the day to saying the prayers you were committed to saying. So you stay up late catching up with those prayers 
such that you can't help with getting the kids ready for school in the morning. I hope you're getting the picture. Be sure that you're being led in love. And if not, ease up a bit. A Lenten discipline is something you take up in order to tackle some vice that keeps you from loving God. Something like fasting if you find that, fool, that food is in control of you, or acts of mercy if money is in control of your time, or taking time to pray or read scripture because your entertainments are perhaps less than godly. These are things you do to bring you closer to God in love and more ready to com contemplate God in love. Disciplines such as these aren't designed to make you miserable or perhaps just as importantly, your loved ones miserable, though they may reveal some unpleasant things about yourself and your attachments. That's certainly uncomfortable. But make sure that you are clear that the scope of such disciplines as you pull the weeds out of your heart, as you till the ground of your heart, is that you are, through such disciplines, turning to and growing in love towards God. And so I would encourage you to choose a Lenten discipline. And no, you don't have to take trips to the deep deserts of northern Egypt to do that. They can be simple. You can reorient yourself and turn once again in love towards God. To pick up your cross in the knowledge that the cross given to you will be easy and light. To purify your heart. To pull up some weeds and to till that soil like a farmer who has eyes on an easy life once the farming is done. Purify your heart that you may grow in love of God that you would be ready for God's kingdom. A kingdom where all this may pass away, but for love, which will remain. A kingdom given as a gift, a gift of love from a Lord who has first loved us, that we may too grow again in love for him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, every year at the time of the Christian Passover, we celebrate our redemption through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lent is a time to prepare for this celebration and to renew our life in the Paschal Mystery. We begin this holy season by remembering our need for repentance and for the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. We begin our journey to Easter with the sign of ashes, an ancient sign speaking of the frailty and uncertainty of human life and making the penitence of the community as a whole. I invite you therefore in the name of the Lord to observe a holy Lent by self-examination, penitence, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, and by reading and meditating on the Word of God. Let us kneel before our Creator and Redeemer.
Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you, to one another, and to the whole communion of saints in heaven and on earth, that we have sinned by our own fault in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, Lord. We have been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, Lord. We confess to you, Lord, all our past unfaithfulness, the pride, hypocrisy, and impatience of our lives. We confess to you, Lord. Our self-indulgent appetites and ways, and our exploitation of other people, we confess to you, Lord our anger at our own frustration, and our envy of those more fortunate than ourselves, we confess to you, Lord. Our intemperate love of worldly goods and comforts, and our dishonesty in daily life and work, we confess to you, Lord. Our negligence in prayer and worship, and our failure to commend the faith that is in us, we confess to you, Lord. Accept our repentance, Lord, for the wrongs we have done, for our blindness to human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. Accept our repentance, Lord. For all false judgments, for uncharitable thoughts toward our neighbors, and for our prejudice and contempt toward those who differ from us, accept our repentance, O Lord. For our waste and pollution of your creation and our lack of concern for those who come after us, accept our repentance, Lord. Restore us, good Lord, and let your anger depart from us. Hear us, Lord for your mercy is great. Almighty God, from the dust of the earth you have created us. May these ashes be a sign for us of our mortality and penitence and a reminder that only by your gracious gift are we given eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
Accomplish in us, O God, the work of your salvation. By the cross and passion of your Son, our Lord. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. I invite you to sing our closing hymn, number 178, Restore in Us, O God. The words can be found in your hymnal or in your bulletin. Thank you.